I sit down, pop a piece of spearmint gum and watch the woman across from me. She's nervous. Her hands are fretting in her lap and her eyes are bloodshot. Long night, I ask. She looks up, timidly. Her face is awash in anxiety. She doesn't understand what's going on. She doesn't understand what she's doing here, sitting inside an abandoned warehouse with an asshole twice her age. It's fine, I've seen it before. Look, I say, loosening the tie around my neck. It's just like I said, I only want to ask you a few questions, then you can go. Why here, she says in a small voice. This looks like the kind of place you take me to. I don't know, murder me. I crack a smile. She isn't wrong. You don't like it? It's private. Besides that, it's probably the safest place in the world for you. Why? Do you have snipers on the rafters? There's sarcasm in her voice, but her eyes still flick to the dimly lit steel walkways lining the walls. She pulls her sweater tighter around her, shivering at the draft. Or is this some secret government fortress? No and no. I lean back in the wooden chair and it groans under my robe. I'm not as slim as I used to be. It's much simpler, I say. This warehouse is the safest place for you because I'm inside of it. It's not a lie, at least, not entirely. Still, she gives me an incredulous look. It's the sort of look one reserves for blowhards and narcissists, and I probably deserve it. Time to change gears. Tell me about the event. She studies me for several moments, then shakes her head. On second thought, she says, picking up her purse. I think I'd prefer talking to the police. She stands up, makes to leave and I don't stop her. Her footfalls echo across the empty warehouse, the haphazard lighting casting her shadow in every direction. I hear her mutter something beneath her breath, but I can't make out the words. I probably don't want to. Then she stops. They always do. What's an event? She asks quietly. I click my pen and reach down for my clipboard with a groan. My last job really did a number on my ribs. An event, I explain, is a paranormal phenomenon most commonly characterized by contact with a sentient entity. To use a more common turn of phrase, it means you stumbled across an urban legend. She swallows. At this distance, I can just barely make out her expression, but I already know I have her. I bring my pen to my clipboard and clear my throat. <clears throat> you said your name was Amanda Haynes, correct? Yes. I scribble it down on my form. And the event occurred two nights ago, just outside city limits in the Cascade Mountains. Her sneakers patter across the concrete floor as she returns to her chair. Her expression shifts. Gone is the nervous shyness, the small posture and the darting eyes. She's staring at me now. She's deciding whether she's in or out. Yes, she says at length. It was in the woods. We were camping. I check three more boxes on my clipboard. Stupendous. So far, the location matches up with previous sightings of the beast. I sigh, resting the clipboard in my lap and place my pen on top of it. Why don't we start from the top? Before we do, she says, narrowing her eyes. How do I know I can trust you? This feels so bizarre, I offer. Dramatic, like I'm in an episode of The X-Files. Fair point, you've seen my badge. Badges can be faked. I bring a hand to my face, tracing along deep scars. How about these? You don't get these working for television. She's quiet, skeptical, and her eyes drift down to the clipboard on my lap. She's analyzing it, determining if it's a real government form or not. All things I've seen before, she wants to believe, but she isn't ready yet. Let me ask you this, I say, handing her the clipboard. She begins looking it over. When you told the search and rescue team a monster attacked you, did they believe you? Her eyes met mine and I see it, the surrender. She knows as well as I do that I'm her only shot. What she doesn't know is she's my only shot too. I've been looking for this legend for close to 40 years now. One might say it's been my life's work. I see your point, she concedes. Let's get this over with. She passes the clipboard back to me and I click my pen, bringing it to the box labeled Encounter. All right, you said that you were camping. Who was with you? Just Rachel, she says. Her eyes are filled with something, guilt, maybe. We'd been friends since elementary school. We hiked together pretty often. Ah, I say, noting her name on my clipboard. Rachel Tully, correct? The victim. Amanda nods. We went up to get a break from the doldrums of city life. Rachel just got out of a pretty serious relationship and I didn't want her cooped up in that apartment. 
stuck with all those memories. Her voice cracks. Emotion spills into her words. I suggested we take the weekend and go for a hike into the Cascades. There's an old trail we spotted the last time we were up there, just off the main path. I said we could follow that, see where it leads us. She brings a sleeve to her face, wiping it forming tears. Rachel didn't want to. She said she was too depressed to shop for groceries, much less go on such a big hike. I, um, I convince her eventually, though. I see, I say quietly. How long was the hike? I don't know. It was a really old trail, overgrown in parts. There weren't any mile markings. Ballpark it. Eight miles, maybe? We left early that morning, and it took us seven hours to get up there. I whistle, scratching at my gut. That's quite the walk. It's not that bad, honestly. We'd both done longer hikes on harder trails. We actually didn't go as far as we intended. Why's that? We came across an old cabin. It was run down with shattered windows and it looked like it hadn't been lived in for decades. My heart pounds in my chest. I swallow the excitement before it has a chance to leak into my voice. I'd gone looking for that cabin a hundred times. It was never there. A cabin? She nods. Her eyes leave mine. They're gazing off at some distant point on the ground, transfixed. We figure it must have been an old ranger cabin, which would explain the overgrown trail that led us there. She pauses, her mouth hanging open, words struggling to break free. Rachel suggests instead of using our tents, we could just stay inside of it. I remind her the windows are busted and it's the middle of November. Plus, it's probably filled with spiders. She says all the better. Let's set up our tents inside the cabin, double the protection. Amanda gnaws on her bottom lip, her voice growing smaller and smaller with each passing sentence. There's dark clouds above us. It was supposed to rain, but it looks worse than that now, a lot worse. It looks like a storm's coming, so I agree, and we head inside to check the place out. What did it look like on the inside? I ask quietly. It looked like a nest. We spend some time walking around it. It isn't very big. There's only a handful of rooms, but there's branches and leaves all over the floor. Every step we take, there's a snap of a twig. The entrance leads through a small kitchen alcove with a wood stove and dining table. Past that, it opens up to a living area with some rotting chairs, and at the very end is a bedroom filled with splinters from a broken bed frame. The place is a mess. The layout sounds familiar. I can almost smell the cedar and feel the toasty warmth of the wood stove burning during cold December evenings. I check out the bedroom first, she says. I spot a couple of shattered picture frames. Call it the millennial blogger in me, or call it dumb curiosity, but I'm drawn to them. One is old, yellowed, and faded. It looks like it could be from the 30s. It's a picture of a young man and woman, dressed to the nines, probably their wedding day. She smacks her lips and then looks up at me. Do you have anything to drink? I nod. Of course. I reach down and unclasp my briefcase, opening it up to reveal a flurry of documents and three water bottles, two filled with water, one filled with a black grime. I grab the two filled with water, crack them both, and pass one to her. We both take a sip. Thanks, she says, wiping her lips. All this talking works up a thirst. Not surprised. So far, it's an interesting account. I'd like to hear more. She nods. The other picture is more recent. I mean, still old, but not ancient, she laughs. But it's a nervous, self-conscious laugh. It's a photo of an older guy and a young kid with this mess of black hair. The two of them are standing outside the cabin holding rifles. Interesting. Yeah, I figure it's probably the ranger that lived there back when the cabin was operational. Before I can check out anything else though, I hear a snap. It sounds like wood cracking in half, and then a crash. I drop the picture frame, and Rachel starts screaming from the other room. Screaming? I lean forward, my pen scratching at the clipboard. It feels too early for the callous man to appear. Certain criteria haven't been met. Still, if the work of my late colleagues has taught me anything, it's that legends can evolve. I keep an open mind. Amanda nods. Yeah. She's screaming bloody murder. I storm in there, my bare mace in hand, expecting to see a wolf or cougar or bear, but I don't see shit. I don't even see Rachel. I call out to her and she calls back, but she's whimpering. The sound is coming from the pantry just outside the kitchen alcove. I look toward it, but I don't see her there. I jog over, wondering what the f 
is going on. When I catch sight of the floorboards inside of it, they're busted, splintered and shattered. There's a dark hole in the ground, one big enough for a man to fit through. I almost have a heart attack when her arm reaches out of the blackness. Amanda closes her eyes, takes a deep breath. She shouts at me to get her out of there. I tell her to give me a second and I take off my jacket and put it over the jutting pieces of broken floorboards because I don't want her getting impaled on the things. And then I reach down and pull her up. She's bawling her eyes out, hyperventilating. And once she's firmly out of the pit, she's pointing to her foot. I ask her if she's hurt and she tells me she thinks she twisted her ankle. Pieces of Amanda's event are beginning to connect in my mind. The twisted ankle, the panicked friend, they're all familiar ingredients. And the end dish is anything but delicious. She keeps talking. Rachel says we need to get help right now, and I'm a little thrown off by her panic. I mean, it's a twisted ankle, not a death sentence, right? Still, I pull out my phone and check for service. Predictably, there isn't any. I ask Rachel for hers, and she can hardly speak. She's still pointing. But this time it isn't at her foot, it's at the hole in the cabin floor. She keeps whimpering about dead things over and over, dead things, dead things, dead things. I'm wondering if I just became a party to my best friend having a psychotic break, but I give her the benefit of the doubt and check out the hole. It's dark enough that I can't see the bottom, so I flick on my phone's light. Her fingers play at the tips of her hair, tugging at it. It takes me a bit for my eyes to adjust, but once they do, my blood goes cold. There's bones littering the ground, deer bones, rabbit bones, then there, at the edge of my vision, I catch sight of a human skull. I'm swearing up a storm and my imagination's going haywire. Rachel's hysterical and I'm feeding into it. Both of us are repeating the words, what the f like it's a personal mantra. Amanda takes a breath, holding it for a few moments. There's goosebumps on her arms. Even reciting the account is beginning to work her up. She exhales. Then I remember I'm not living inside of a horror movie. I remember what I thought Rachel was screaming about in the first place. I tell her to relax, that it's probably just a mountain lion or grizzly's dumping ground. In the basement? I ask. Sorry, she says hastily. I probably should have mentioned it earlier, but the cabin's raised off the ground on these wooden stilts. Where I'm at, it helps things avoid getting trapped beneath snow. There's a crawl space beneath it. I figure an animal was probably using the crawl space as some sort of shelter. I check a box on my form. The story matches up, so far at least. The cabin is identical to the one in my memories. The question is, did she really encounter the callous man or some rabid wolf? A human skull is a promising detail, but it's not like predators don't occasionally snack on hikers. A logical conclusion to draw, I say. Does it calm your friend down? Yeah, Amanda says with a nod. Rachel starts to breathe a little slower. She relaxes a little, eventually, She's ready to try standing, and she can, but just barely. She limps over to a dusty wooden chair near the fireplace and sits down in it, grimacing. She tells me she doesn't think she can make it back down the mountain. There's a crack of thunder in the distance. I walk over to the windows and see the sun turning a blood red, setting over the tree line. Storm clouds are rolling in. Rain starts pitter-pattering on the cabin roof. Rachel's groaning in pain, and she shows me her phone, it doesn't have service either. You were picked up by a search and rescue team, weren't you? Yes. How's that, if you had no way of contacting them? You weren't gone longer than anticipated. Amanda sighs. I was just about to get to that, actually. There's an undercurrent of annoyance in her tone. She clearly doesn't care for interruptions once she gets going. I lean back in my chair. All the better for me. Like I said, Rachel and I go on these sort of hikes pretty often. Me more than her, but still. I come prepared. All weather clothing, bare mace, flint and steel, you name it, I got it. I don't cut corners, so I made sure to pack my GPS locator beacon. It sends a one-way distress signal. Ah, I say, noting in the report, a survivalist. The fire in her eyes falters and she pauses. A moment of silence stretches between us, and when she starts talking again, her voice cracks. Not as much of a survivalist as I should have been. Rachel wants me to use it, but I tell her no. Odd. Hear me out. Amanda's eyes connect with mine, and there's a pleading expression on her face, a desperation to be understood. Rachel wasn't in any immediate danger, not then. Neither of us were. Plus, a storm was rolling in, and it looked like a big one. She takes a shuddering breath. I know the look. Memories are clawing at her mind. 
My father was a search and rescue technician. He was killed trying to rescue a couple of teenagers who got themselves trapped in a cave. Ah, there it is. The tragic backstory. I was wondering when it'd squirm its way out of her mouth. Somehow, all the human stupidity in the world can be traced back to our emotions, overriding our will to survive. I scratch her reasoning down on the clipboard. I didn't want anybody risking their lives when we had food, shelter, and weren't in danger. I told her no, no way. I, I couldn't have that blood on my hands if something went wrong and she trails off. And Rachel understood. Amanda gets quiet. She's staring at me. And there's that same look I've seen a thousand times before. I want to roll my eyes. I want to spit in her face for being such a naive idealist, but I hold it down. Instead, I plaster an understanding smile on my lips and nod my head sagely. You made the right choice. It was the only choice you could have made, knowing what you knew in that moment. It works, she perks up. Yeah, I suppose. So the two of you decide to stay inside the cabin then? You're not worried about the bear or cougar using it as a snack bar might swing by? At that point, we don't really have another choice. I'm the outdoorsy type. I've seen storms, and I know that the one coming our way is going to be a big one. We decide the cabin's our best bet, but we take precautions. I keep my bear mace close by, and we close all the doors. A cougar isn't going to open a door, and a bear might break it down, but only if it feels it needs to. It's far more likely to wander into the crawl space, safely away from us. Sure, makes sense. I decide to put an extra layer between us and the front door though, just in case. I clear out the busted bed frame and sweep the splinters from the bedroom floor. Then I get to work setting up the tent. Her voice dies. Memories are calling to her again. Difficult memories. What happened? I ask, the hairs on my arms rising. Did you see something? She nods. Yes. Animals were running through the clearing outside of the window. They were running past the cabin, deers, rabbits, then a whole flock of birds burst through the treetops and started flying over us. I lick my lips. Yes, this is very promising. My pen scratches at the clipboard in excitement. The callous man has a defining characteristic, one unique to him in the realm of legends. He always comes from the same direction, always. Which way were the animals running? Her voice is small, brittle. I barely hear it over the sound of my pounding heart. South, she says. I write the word and underline it three times. My fingers are shaking with excitement. My mind's racing. After so many dead ends and broken threads, so many killed and missing, it's finally coming together. I found one, a survivor. And not only that, but one that might still have the link. How many animals were running? I ask. I know the answer, but I need to hear her say it. It takes her a second to get the words out. They're uncomfortable for her, disturbing. All of them, she whispers. It was like an exodus of life. My heart hammers, my breath quickens, all of it. Each detail of her story means one thing. The callous man is coming. I take a breath and stand up from the chair, stretching my legs. My back feels like it's been crushed between two boulders and sitting for any length of time always turns it into a pin cushion. Still, I couldn't be happier. Everything all right? She asks. Peachy. I pick up the clipboard and clear my throat. What happens after the animals flee the tree line? She opens her mouth to speak, but stops. Her eyes glance down to my open briefcase, staring at the manila folders and the crinkled old water bottle filled with grimy black fluid. Why do you have that? She says, wrinkling her nose. Its label is yellow. It looks like it's 20 years old. What's that gunk inside? I scowl, kicking my briefcase closed. An experiment. It's nothing to concern yourself with. Now then, if you wouldn't mind continuing, I'd like to hear what happened following the exodus. There's a moment of shared disdain between us. She feels like I'm hiding something from her, and I feel like she's putting her nose in places it doesn't belong. Thankfully, it doesn't last long, and she continues her account. Rachel calls my name from the main area. Then she limps into the bedroom, leaning against the doorway. She looks really shaken up. She asks if I saw all the animals taking off, and I tell her I did. Her eyes are getting wide, and I can tell she's throwing herself into another panic attack. So I, I tell her that they're probably just running from the storm. Do you believe it? I don't know, maybe. It seemed like the only logical reason 
But at the same time, the whole scene felt so eerie, so wrong. She opens her water bottle and takes a drink. Either way, it's not like I'm gonna start feeding into Rachel's paranoia. One of us has to be calm, right? I shrug. Sure. You said the sun was setting when the animals made a run for it. Is it dark yet? She nods. Mostly. I mean, the last rays of sunlight are just barely peeking over the treetops. The storm's making it worse. The clouds are blocking a lot of the light. I have to move on with finishing setting up the tent. And we set up this LED lantern that Rachel brought. It feels weird. In what way? The silence. She pauses, shakes her head, and then mutters something. Sorry, that's the wrong word. It isn't silent. The wind is howling and the rain's coming down pretty hard. But there's no sound of life. No crows cawing. No squirrels chattering. I don't even see any bugs in the cabin, despite a whole shitload of spider webs. I brush it off, though. I keep telling myself one of us has to be calm. So we close the bedroom door and settle ourselves into the tent. Neither of us have much of an appetite, so we eat a couple of protein bars for supper and pull out our books. We don't talk. I don't even know if we actually read. I know I don't. I stare at the words, but my mind's a million miles away, too wrapped up in the feeling that something is wrong with this place. Something's wrong with this scenario. She sighs, running a hand through her blonde hair. Chalk it up to the darkness. Things always seem scarier in the dark, you know? I nod. The dark has always had a powerful effect on human beings. It makes it more difficult for us to see our enemies. And in my line of work, easier for them to see you. It's a lose-lose environment. Unfortunately, it's often a necessary one. You don't talk at all? I ask, sitting back down in my chair. Not at first. After 10, maybe 20 minutes, Rachel breaks the silence. She asks if we should use my rescue beacon since it's getting pretty bad outside. I know that's not why she wants to use it though, not the real reason. I remind her that we can weather the storm in here and call for help in the morning once the storm clears. Amanda screws up her face like she's holding back a wave of emotions. I manipulate her. I remind her my dad was killed during a botched search and rescue job, all because some teenagers couldn't exercise a little common sense. I study her. Perhaps she's more cunning than I thought. Naive though, still so naive. Rachel lets up. She agrees we can call in the morning. I can tell she's scared, and honestly, so am I. And I know that we're both thinking, so I blurt out that there's no such thing as monsters. I tell her we're f***ing adults, and we'll deal with this. Amanda chuckles. It's a small thing, full of disbelief and regret. I promise her we'll laugh about it in the morning. The woman's not bad with the story. I idly wonder how popular her blog is. Unlike the gum in my mouth, her words have flavor. I dig in my jacket pocket and pull out my pack, popping a fresh piece free. It's not a cigarette, but it's the next best thing. Famous last words, I say with a grim smile. What's Rachel think of your pep talk? She, she's fine with it at first. I think she might even be on board. She doesn't want to spend the night terrified any more than I do. So anything that makes that fear a little smaller is a welcome distraction. Amanda swallows and her expression goes blank. It seems like everything's going to be just fine. Like it's just another overnight hike, at least until we hear the footsteps outside. Here we go. There's a creaking sound, like old wood straining under something's weight. It's hard to hear over the roaring wind, but given our mental states, it's practically unmissable. Something's outside. The footsteps are slow, gradual. Whatever's out there is taking its time, and both of us are frozen in fear. Rachel grabs the lamp and turns it off, and I suddenly realize just how dark it really is. It's pitch black. I can barely see Rachel, and she's sitting close enough that we're touching. It's just us, the storm, and the sound of footsteps now. I whisper to her that it's probably a deer, or maybe a mountain lion, or just some kind of animal looking for shelter from the storm. Amanda's eyes are glazed, her hands picking at the fabric of her jeans. She's lost in the memory. I don't believe in myself. Something inside of me is rioting and telling me that we're not safe. We haven't been safe since the moment we walked into that cabin, and we won't be safe until we're far away. Still, I take a breath. I repeat that stupid internal mantra that one of us needs to be an adult, 
One of us needs to be rational. So we wait. I whisper to her that all the doors are closed. No animals are going to get inside. We're safe. We're safe. I keep repeating it. Like if I say it enough, I'll start believing it too. I do my best to reassure her and stave off another panic attack. Amanda uncaps her water bottle and takes a quick swig. Her hands grip it, squeezing, and the plastic crinkles. It works, maybe. I can't see her, but I can't hear her either. She's not screaming, it's good. She swallows. Then I realize things are bad, really bad. Why? We hear the sharp whining sound, like rusty hinges, and we recognize it. It's the front door of the cabin. Something opened it. The next second, the sharp whining is followed by dull thuds, like heavy footsteps. The floorboards groan, and we hear it, whatever it is, moving through the kitchen and into the main area. I remind myself to keep writing, but it's hard. This is the moment I've been waiting for, the moment when I can finally determine whether or not she's actually encountered the monster I've been chasing my entire life. I'm clutching my can of bear mace to my chest and Rachel's whimpering beside me. I'm hissing at her to be quiet, to shut the f up because I know that if whatever's out there hears us, it's going to come in here. She listens, neither of us move. We just listen for the footsteps. Thunder's crashing outside and the weather's screaming through the busted window. But somehow in spite of it all, those footsteps are clear as day. I couldn't tune them out if I'd tried. Her fingers find the armrests of her chair and she grips them. They scratch against the tattered wood. I pull the safety tab on my bear mace, ready to blast something if that's what it takes. Rachel grabs my arm, and I feel her hand trembling. Her whole body is. Something smells like piss, and I realize it's her. She's losing it. The footsteps get closer. They're halfway through the living area now, and they're approaching the bedroom door. Whatever's out there is close enough that we can hear this snickering sound like really fast, short breaths. Nah, nah, nah. It doesn't sound human, but it doesn't sound like any animal I've heard either. It sounds like a nightmare. I circle a box on my clipboard, identifying the sound is correct. According to more recent eyewitness encounters, the callous man snickers before engaging with his prey, an evolution of his mythology. In my memories, I recall only the screaming. Amanda keeps talking. Rachel squeezing my arm so hard that it hurts. Her nails are digging into me and I can feel her warm piss on the bottom of the tent. It's soaking through my jeans, but I don't care. I don't do a damn thing. I can't. Because as soon as I make a sound or a move, those footsteps are going to get faster and something's going to open the bedroom door. And then I don't know what happens. She stops talking. Tears are forming in the corners of her eyes and she grips her sweater sleeve and dabs at them. Rachel. Rachel can't take it anymore. She reaches across me, hissing at me to give her the rescue beacon. She's begging me to activate it, and I'm trying to get my hand over her mouth and shut her up, but she's desperate and she's fighting me. The footsteps pick up their pace. They're walking toward us. These heavy thumps on the creaking floor. I whisper to Rachel if we send the distress call, the beacon's going to start beeping. Tears slip down her cheeks and Amanda stares, transfixed at the concrete floor. There's something swimming in her eyes. And I think it's self-loathing, but I can't be sure. All I know is it's familiar. Continue, I say. Rachel gets hold of it. She hammers at its buttons and it works. It starts beeping. The signal's sent. Amanda's voice trembles. Her lips quiver with the onset of her next words. The bedroom door opens. It's this long drawn out screech and both of us freeze. It's just the rusty hinges and the beacon beeping. I want to scream, I want to run. I think we both do, but we're too afraid. We're paralyzed. She swallows. I get my finger ready on the trigger of the bear mace. I don't want to use it inside. It'll probably f us up just as bad as whatever's standing in the doorway, but I'm ready to if I have to. Moments pass and all we hear is the beacon beeping and the rain and thunder outside. Then there's that snickering again, fast and raspy. It's followed by footsteps. And now that it's in the room with us, it sounds big. The tent shakes, the whole room shakes. It's dark enough that we can't see so much as a shadow through the canvas of the tent, but soon we don't need to. The footsteps start circling us. And then a finger presses to the wall of the tent and begins tracing around it. Whatever it is, it starts sniffing softly at first, then louder and with more intensity. I realize it isn't a man. It's some kind of animal. It sounds beast-like, feral, and hungry. Amanda closes her eyes, putting her head in her hands. She takes a moment and groans. 
When she looks up again, her eyes are hollow. Rachel can't stand it. She screams. She screams to leave us alone. She screams we have a gun. She turns on the lantern and tells it to f*** off, go to hell, die in a fire, you name it. I'm going to assume that didn't go over well. She rubs her arm anxiously. I don't know. It seemed like it went just fine. The thing left. Excuse me? I say, lowering my clipboard onto my lap. It left? That's it? My hand grips my pen hard enough that my knuckles turn white. That can't be. She didn't even get a look at the thing. It left the room, Amanda says in a quiet voice. It walked into the living area, but then it stopped. It didn't leave the cabin. Her voice trembles. It waited. It waited until it didn't. And then the real horror began. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.